Okay. Um, hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, speak here. Um, last conference last year was my first conference here. I really enjoyed it and was anxious to get back and have enjoyed this conference also. So, um, What I'm going to talk about are cellulosic biofuels and some tools that we're using to um, probe a little bit deeper um, into the global warming potential of these uh, biofuels um, with respect to um, time of emissions. We're going to talk about how we use this dynamic global warming potential as a more sensitive and more robust way to understand the global warming potential of these materials. Okay. Of course, in biofuels, um, there's some serious debate about what's going on. Um, in some scenarios, you can have uh, forests um, and land use change um, to convert the areas into um, producing crops, and then you can have things like biodiesel, and that's one option. Um, or you can have other options. Um, the one that we like to look at and compare to these are um, using um, land for uh, managed forests for high growth, and then managing the harvest, and then getting uh, biofuels from these living cellulosics um, as a fossil fuel disposal. And the questions come up, you know, it's not really that obvious whether um, biofuels will positively or negatively impact the environment compared to fossil fuels. And so we're trying to understand you know, what are the tools that we need to, to kind of probe this question. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about global warming potential today, which is just a small portion of the overall picture, but an important part. Okay, so this is kind of an outline of my talk. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we do dynamic global warming potential. Then we're going to talk about, for biofuels, um, the different um, time zero assumptions. And then we'll talk briefly about land use change, how it might impact overall. So um, many people might be familiar with this, with the carbon flows in the atmosphere. And we're talking about the carbon in the atmosphere and how it might impact global warming. And we've got two pathways. Um, we've got vegetation. Um, and um, we have uh, the growth of that vegetation um, taking carbon dioxide out, and then we've got vegetation putting the CO2 in, and then some CO2 from the soil. We've got a cycle here. And then on the other hand, we've got fossil fuels, and that's just a one-way era. I think most people are familiar with that. And we're trying to take advantage of cycling here when we talk about biofuels. So um, the carbon flows, um, for instance, if we want to power our cars, uh, we've got to combust some type of fuel, and what you can see is for the biofuels, we have this cycle. So we put CO2 into the atmosphere, and we also take it out by the plant growth. Whereas for fossil fuels, it's one way. So um, typically, when, as the previous speaker talked about, um, when we have a project or a product, um, we typically um, default to a 100-year time horizon. And basically what we do is, um, for most carbon footprints, we just uh, make the assumption that or, or do the calculation with all the emissions occurring at time equals zero and that they affect the environment for 100 years. And we can look at that as our um, analysis point. However, for things that, have, um, that are um, slow or have time dependent, see, um, for instance, if we have a house here and we might have a remodel of the house after 25 years, um, if we use this kind of framework, we would just assume that all of the emissions over a 100-year period are within our system boundary. So we sh artificially shift this arrow over into this region. So we would think of the emissions at 25 years equal to the emissions at zero years. And then for end of life, maybe occurring at 50 years, what we see is that our, you know, our interests, our time interests right here, doesn't really match what's going on in real life. <coughs> Even though we take this arrow and all those emissions and just artificially put them here, it would be more appropriate to understand how this timing actually affects the global warming potential. So this is just the global warming potential, and we, we mainly focus on these um, three gases for biofuels. Um, just a little bit. All right. So what we're going to use is instead of that static, everything occurs at time equals zero. Um, we'll, we'll talk about dynamic life cycle assessment, where we're looking at the timing of um, the emissions and also the removals of CO2 from the, uh, from the environment. 
Okay, so this is a little bit more complex, um, additional assumptions and more math, but we think it's more robust. All right, so if we take a look, um, what we do is we calculate what's called a global warming impact, and it's called instantaneous. So it's basically the emissions of a certain gas over, um, for one year, and then basically we have, instead of a characterization, a static characterization factor, we have a dynamic characterization factor. And that takes into account the decay of the gas and um, relative to its time of release. So, for instance, um, what I'll do here is I'll compare two systems. The first system right here has 10 kilograms of CO2 emitted at year, year one. And we'll compare that to um, one, 10 kilograms of CO2, but it will be emitted over a 10-year period, one kilogram at a time. So you can see that in this system, we have a delay of the CO2 emissions. And what we'll do is, um, and then these are the instantaneous um, cumulative radiated force, okay? So this is the impact that we have um, on for each year instantaneously. But what we want to do is we'll want to integrate the areas under these curves, and that will be the cumulative impact. And so here's our equation for that. And then basically what you see is for the two systems, their cumulative effect is, is very different. In fact, um, for the one that the 10 kilograms were emitted early, we see that the global warming cumulative um, effect is always higher than when it's delayed. Okay? And that's what we're trying to capture in our studies, that the timing can have an impact on the um, effect. Okay. Now the last thing we do um, when we present our data is we, um, do, we report what's called a dynamic LCA, the global warming potential impacts. And basically what that is is the global warming impact cumulative so that's from the previous slide where we integrate the instantaneous over. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll integrate that over for a certain threshold. And we'll look at how the threshold affects our calculations. And then we'll compare that to an instantaneous pulse of CO2 equivalent at time equal zero. And that will be our denominator. So this kind of normalizes the different gases and the different emissions. All right. So basically what we're talking about in biofuels is the fact that um, the um, the growth of the trees or the plants happen not at all time equal zero, and some. And we're also looking at um, at time equal zero. We can make an assumption that we plant the trees, and then they grow, and then we cut them down later on in the future. Or we can make the assumption that we harvest standing trees, and then replant, and then they grow. Okay, and these two things have a very different um, CO two emission profile. Okay. And then basically we'll also talk about that feedstocks with longer growing cycles with longer delays of emissions and growth will be more sensitive to the least accounting methods. Okay? So this is our system boundary and what we do is we look at biomass production which includes direct land use change. And then we look at fuel production. Um, we use Aspen model to simulate the process. In this case we're using a biochemical conversion and we use system expansion for electricity. And we use green for the fuel use, so the combustion of the fuel in automobiles is modeled there. Um, then we use some LCA databases to get um, some of the chemicals and energy that we don't have um, primary data on. And the other thing is the indirect land use change is not considered here. All right, and so basically um, this kind of reviews what I was talking about before. And I'll just skip that. All right. So if we look at the system in a non-dynamic way to just kind of couch everything, um, what you'll see is that this is the global warming potential um, for a megajoule of ethanol or a megajoule <coughs> of liquid fuel. Okay, so that will be our basis of calculation to compare things. And we have uh, several biomasses here, pine, eucalyptus, natural hardwood, switchgrass, sweet sorghum with two kinds of technology. The sweet sorghum has monomeric sugars, if we wash those sugars out prior to some processing, we have a more efficient process. So we have two little technologies here for sweet sorghum. And here's the overall result. And you can see that the global the CO2 that's emitted is actually positive for all these biomasses per megajoule of ethanol, um, except for the pine. It turns out that the pine um, has a co-product of electricity that um, actually, uh, when we use system expansion, uh, makes this negative. 
Um, one of the points here is that the feedstock production, the growth of the plants, occurs over many years. So while these things actually happen instantaneously, they have some certain timing, but they happen very quickly, this happens over many years. We want to capture that information in our models. Okay. All right. So basically what we do in the dynamic greenhouse gas inventory, we list the emissions per each year. Um, we also are going to consider what happens at time zero, either planting or um, yeah, planting or cutting, and then we'll look at the how this um, assumption affects the results. Okay, so this is for pine. I hope people can see this. Um, oh no, this is for um, planet time zero, excuse me. And we have our different, we're going to show three different uh, biomasses. Um, pine um, grows with a um, rotation of about 12 years. The eucalyptus is harvested after a rotation of only four <coughs> years, so it's much faster. And then the unmanaged hardwood um, might be harvested after 50 years. Okay, so that's a much slower growing um, process. And basically, what you have here are the different um, life cycle, well, this, the different operations or in the um, in the life cycle: growth, establishment, harvest, uh, fuel production, and fuel use. So basically, what you'll notice here is for a plant at time zero, what we're allowing for is that we're planting it and we're taking up CO2 from the environment in the earlier years. And then uh, we get a large emission um, when we use that, when we convert that material and um, convert it and then use it in our um, vehicles. So the, I, the, what happens here is that the emissions, um, the utility of the biofuels, is delayed either 13 years, 4 or 5 years, or 50 years, okay? So in this case where we plant at time zero and then cut, cut the um, biomass down after a long time, where actually the emissions are delayed, okay? And you can see that taking CO2 out early, that's going to have a lot, a long effect on the, um, on the CO2 in the environment um, for, yeah? And then this is gonna have a delayed effect, okay? Now the other assumption that you can make is that we cut the biomass down at time equals zero and then we replant and grow. And what you'll see here is that the large emissions from production and conversion and use occur now at time, at early in the time. So they have a long time to impact the environment over our um, threshold, our time thresholds. And then the um, savings in CO2 or the um, removal of CO2 from the environment that now is delayed relative to the use. So you have these two different scenarios. All right, now let's look at the calculations. Um, so if we look at these two assumptions, we're going to try and compare them and see how they impact our overall dynamic LCA, our global warming potentials. Okay, so we have plant at zero and cut at zero. So if we cut, um, now we're going to look at eucalyptus, which was our fastest growing biomass, and um, for the woods. And then basically, if you cut, you get this um, uh, emission early. And then what happens is if those plants grow, um, the instantaneous, now this is instantaneous, on the year-to-year -year basis, the, um, the emissions actually go down on an instantaneous basis. And then they reach this steady state right here as the plants grow. And that goes over a 500-year period. Now, you can compare that to planet zero. When you plant at zero, what will happen is um, you're starting to, um, actually the plants are growing, and so you've got this negative instantaneous global warming potential. And then as you cut the material down and use it for biofuels, you get this positive, you're up here, and then it just kind of slowly comes down. So you can see that these two assumptions have different instantaneous emissions. Now, if we integrate the area under those curves, um, we get the cumulative radiative impact. And basically what you see is that that assumption where you cut at zero, has a much higher cumulative radiative um, force function than the plant at zero. So when you plant and, and re remove the CO2 and then use it in the material, you get this. And over the 100 year threshold, what you can see is the difference here is very significant. So this assumption um, is very significant for our 100 year threshold. Okay. And then if you look at the dynamic um, LCA, the kilograms of CO2 equivalent, um, for these using the um, temporal analysis, what you'll see is that if you plant at time zero, that's about 40 or 50% lower 
then cut at zero. Because the scale is so large, um, it kind of minimizes this effect, but this is big. This is a big, big consideration. So over that 100 year threshold, we've got um, less, about 50% of the impact for the planet zero than we have at cut at zero. Now, we can compare that. This system was for a relatively fast growing material that has harvested over five year um, rotation. We can compare that with unmanaged hardwood. So what you'll see here is that everything is exaggerated when the timing gets slower and slower. So um, the cut at zero right here, um, what we do is we have this big emission. And then because the hardwoods grow so much slower, it takes a lot longer for those instantaneous global warming potentials to start to um, be much smaller and then actually negative. For the plant at zero, we plant and we are getting all these negative the CO2 removals from the environment. Then we use the biomass and that bumps it up here and then it slowly goes down to here. So if you take a look at the cumulative radiative force, so we're integrating under these, those curves, what you see is cut at zero actually has this and versus the plant at zero, which is much more negative for a longer time and then it's um, much decreased from here. Now again, if you look at the threshold, 100-year um, threshold, which is just one place to look at the comparison, what you'll see is if you just um, have the plant at zero, basically you have this negative impact, whereas if you cut at zero and then allow those trees to grow back, you have um, a very positive and very different response than um, with the other assumption. So the dynamic LCA, the overall result at 100 years, you can see it's extremely different. Um, having a negative one for the plant at zero, having a positive emission at cut at zero. So very different. And the point here is that the hardwoods that have the faster rotate, uh, the hardwoods that have the slower rotation, um, the dynamic um, global warming impacts are much more important than if you have a very fast growing um, crop. All right. So then what we can do is we can also look at the um, influence of the threshold. So how the time horizon that we're going to be looking at um, for the dynamic LCA radiative forcing. So what you'll see is for pine, for instance, if we cut at time zero, okay, and then we allow the pine trees to grow back, what you'll see is the longer your threshold, that effect impacts the, um, this is the greenhouse gas reductions compared to gasoline. So a larger number here is better. And so if you, we have a time horizon of 100 years, what we see is that the reductions relative to gasoline are much greater than at 25 years. So the threshold that we're choosing makes a big difference. Um, now, what you'll notice is that the threshold is not as important um, when we, um, the threshold is not as important when we have something that's much, much faster growing, like eucalyptus. However, for the slowest growing, the managed hardwood with the longest rotations, what you can see is if you pick um, for cut at time zero, what you'll see is that the reductions are actually negative. That means that um, over a 25 year threshold, that hardwood, unmanaged hardwood is performing worse than gasoline. So this really um, shows you the, um, the effect of threshold on the relative performance of slow growing materials um, relative to gasoline. And the longer you have the threshold, the, the time horizon, excuse me, um, the, the better the unmanaged hardwood performs versus gasoline. But it just shows you the sensitivity of the results to the um, time horizon. Okay. Um, and then the last thing we did was we looked at land use change. Um, so land use change is also an important factor here. Um, and basically the land use change emissions can actually occur over certain time periods. But We'll just look at um, them from uh, one standpoint here. Basically, we're using IPCC data, and we're using a FICAT model. That's a software package that's open, available from McCassie is the uh, agency that's running that. And then the FICAT model kind of tabulates all these things and puts them in a package that are easy to manipulate. And basically, what you see is that the carbon pools for different um, biomass production um, scenarios is different. So for cropland, we have a biomass pool, carbon pool of about 95. Um, for uh, pine, it's 237. So that's quite a bit of tons of carbon per hectare. And then for eucalyptus, it's 153. So you can see that if you go from pine land 
to croplands, you're going to have a net emission of CO2 to the environment. If you go from cropland to pine land, you'll have a net removal of CO2 from the um, and, um, atmosphere. So we're using these numbers right here as an additional uh, method to look at emissions. Okay, so this graph tells us how those land use of, um, changes can affect the greenhouse gas emissions. And basically these bars right here are the percent reduction compared to gasoline and global warming potential of these different biomass to biofuels using the biochemical conversion and the system expansion. What you can see is that pine has about 150% reduction of greenhouse gases um, relative to gasoline. Um, and these bars are without, um, without the land use change. And these data points right here are show you what the overall result is if you, um, if you consider land use change. So for instance, um, for pine, with no land use change, we have 150% reduction. However, if we convert grassland um, to pine land and we consider that, then our greenhouse gas reduction is near 500%. So you can see that conversion of grasslands to um, forests like this has a very um, positive impact on the results. Um, on the other hand, if we go um, look at switchgrass, we have a 60% reduction in global warming potential with no land use change. However, if we convert um, coniferous natural forests to um, cropland, what we get is a negative 70% reduction in gas. So when we take the land use change into account, what we're seeing is that the switchgrass can even have a worse uh, performance than gasoline. All right. So when you switch from um, natural forests to switchgrass, what you'll see is that the savings that you get from using um, thank you. Um, the savings you get from uh, using a biofuel relative to gasoline, there has to be a payback period. So if you take a look at the gasoline, the um, dynamic LCA, the global warming potential in, in the dynamic consideration, it has this result. And for the biofuel switchgrass, if you, um, if you look at land use change, you have to wait these time periods before actually you have this break even point where the um, biofuels have a lower dynamic global warming potential than does the gasoline. And if you look at the payback periods for the land use change, um, they can be very significant. So for instance, if you um, try to make biofuel from switchgrass <coughs> and you convert your land from deciduous natural forest, it takes you 57 years before you actually realize a net improvement in your system. And it can get um, worse um, depending on the assumptions here. The point being is that there's no real advantage to switching to switchgrass from forest um, if your considerations are less than 57 years. Okay. And just kind of to conclude, we feel like this dynamic global warming potential considerations are, more, are very important for biofuels, especially when these products have long life cycle times like growths. And then the time zero assumption is really important. Um, that assumption can be dictated by actually the actual system that is occurring. Um, just some acknowledgments. We were funded by the IBSS and some of our collaborators. And thank you for your attention. Um, with respect to the specific scenario, you're looking at a particular crop, um, and if we were to scale that, you would be looking at maybe a thousand different sources of that crop, all planted and harvested at different times. So some of that dynamic nature would kind of even out, but then I'm still interested in uh, the short cycle types of crops versus the long cycle types of crops. And then to make it more interesting, let's assume that your thousand sources are all different types of biomass, uh, always changing based on the dynamics of market mm -hmm. economics. So are you going to do that as the next part of your study? <laughs> More layers. Um, yeah, we're looking at um, using facilities that have different biomasses that come in, especially for the crops that are only available during certain times of the year. And so, yeah, we feel that there's a big advantage to Very quickly, one question. Um, I'm curious to know, like, why aren't the curves for the that, that 
at time 0 versus plant at time 0, just shifted versions, time shifted versions of uh, each other. Yes. How does the shift happen? Um, well, in real life, you can have an existing stand and you can either you can cut it down and then start the regrow. So that would be where you use the growth at time equals zero assumption. Or you might have crop land and you plant a forest there or yeah, something like eucalyptus for biofuels. And in that case, you would plant and let them grow and then cut them later. So those are two real scenarios that may occur. And when, the, when we use just the regular 100-year non-dynamic threshold, we don't take that into consideration at all. Especially for these units and functional units. Excuse me. You you yeah. have ethanol today, or you have ethanol in ten years. So you have two different functional units there. Yes, that's. The functional unit is missing from this whole analysis, and that I think is a good part of the next phase of work. It would be a great thing to add. Yes. Yeah, so in this work, we've assumed that we have one megajoule of fuel, and we don't really take into consideration. Um, if we need it today or need it later, right. we're just assuming that we have this great demand for it and that it'll always be there at some point. So that is actually one of the weaknesses of this study, that the function might be fuel today versus fuel 20 years from down the road. Well, also, you don't have any, any fuel for uh, the first 20 years. Let's take the big bench. That's right. Uh, yep. That's a great point. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.